All right, well, let's get started. Uh, good morning. My name is John O'Quinn, and it is a pleasure to welcome you to this panel on the role and responsibility of the government employee. We have a fantastic group of distinguished panelists, and I look forward to introducing them to you. Uh, but first, let me just take a moment and introduce our topic for today. When President Trump took office on January 20th of last year, under the Constitution, he was vested with the executive power of the United States. And he assumed the leadership of an enterprise consisting of over four million personnel. Now that's both civilian and military. And for those keeping score, yes, that's more government personnel today uh, than there were uh, people living in the United States at the time of the first census in 1790. Now, while the framers certainly might not have imagined the current size of the government, uh, they did contemplate from the outset that the president would require a variety of executive departments to help him fulfill his constitutional responsibilities uh, and to faithfully execute the laws that were enacted by Congress. For the first 100 years of our history, many, if not most, civilian government employees were appointed through a patronage system that came to be refer referred to as a spoil system. Uh, they served at the pleasure of the president, and this was a system that was fraught with peril, open to corruption, and came under heavy criticism in the late 19th century. The Pendleton Civil Service Reform Act was adopted in the wake of the assassination of President Garfield by a disgruntled lawyer who believed that Garfield owed him a position in the diplomatic corps. And that set the stage for everything to change in terms of how the civil service would be operated. Today, the federal government is overwhelmingly staffed by career employees with civil service protection. Uh, by my estimate, political appointees consist of about one-tenth of one percent of the executive branch workforce. Now, to hear some tell it, that is, of course, a very good thing. The president and his appointees can receive expert advice from career staff with decades of experience and expertise. In some narratives, these are noble public servants with no ax to grind, no ulterior motives, and always above reproach. Other narratives decry the influence of what has come to be called the deep state, in which entrenched, unaccountable government employees act to thwart the will of the people and their democratically elected representatives in order to advance their own agenda. Now, these caricatures, one Pollyannish, the other conspiratorial, may make for sens sensational talking points on primetime television shows, but there's obviously a lot of ground in between these extremes. And so today, we're here to explore what the role and responsibility of government employees in our system, our democratic system of government, is and should be. We're confronted with foundational questions like, what do government employees owe a duty of loyalty to beyond the Constitution, if anything. For government, for government attorneys in the executive branch, who is their client? Is it the president? Is it their agency? Is it their subjective sense of the public interest? Is it something else? What should government employees do if they vehemently disagree with the direction uh, that their agency is taking or uh, of agency policy? Does that depend on whether or not those agencies exceed legal limits in what they're doing and who decides. We are fortunate to have a fantastic panel today to explore these and other difficult questions. A panel that brings to the table an array of government experience, both career and political service. Each will share some opening remarks, then we'll have a group discussion, and then there'll be opportunity for questions from you all here in the audience towards the end. Now first, we'll hear from David Ogden, a partner with the law firm of Wilmer Hale. David most recently served uh, as the Deputy Attorney General of the United States from 2009 to 2010. Pre uh, pre previously, he was the Assistant Attorney General in charge of the Civil Division from 2009 to, excuse me, from 1999 to 2001. He also served as a Deputy General Counsel in the Department of Defense during the Clinton administration. 
David was involved in the, the two presidential transitions that bookended the Bush administration, and he led President-elect Obama's transition team efforts, where I had the opportunity to work with him some when I was serving at the end of the Bush administration and interfacing with, uh, with a lot of David's team. David's seen the complex relationship between political and career staff play out from almost every angle and is going to discuss, among other things, the importance of transparency, uh, trust, and respect in that relationship. And he'll also talk about some of the tensions he's seen that arise between career and political staff in both Democratic and Republican administrations. Next, we have Ted Cooperstein, who currently serves as the General Counsel of the Office of Personnel Management. Now, prior to joining OPM, Ted was a prosecutor. He had 20 years of experience uh, as a prosecutor, including as an AUSA, as counsel to the Deputy Attorney General, and as Assistant General Counsel at the FBI. He retired from the US, uh, U.S. Army Reserves as a Lieutenant Colonel after serving in Operation Enduring Freedom and having been deployed on multiple assignments in the Middle East. Ted will explore some of the specialized considerations that apply to government lawyers in the context of legal ethics principles and how that may differ from the obligations of other government employees. He'll also share some perspectives on contrasting the roles of agency counsel with prosecutors and the roles of, of litigating attorneys more generally. Third, we will hear from Stuart Dellery. Stuart is a partner at Gibson, Dunn, and Crutcher and he previously served in a number of important positions in the Department of Justice during the Obama administration, including as the Assistant Attorney General in charge of the Civil Division and as the Acting Associate Attorney General of the United States, where he oversaw all the department's civil litigating components. Stewart will address some of his experiences working through the interagency process in, in which the, the Department of Justice and other government lawyers go about identifying the interests of the United States. He'll also talk about what the independence of the Justice Department means in different contexts and what the relationship between agency leadership and career officials it looks like from his experience. And finally, we have Roger King. Roger recently retired as a partner at Jones Day, and he joined the HR Policy Association as Senior Labor and Employment Counsel. Roger has 40 years of experience in labor and employment law, and he was co-counsel in the Noel Canning case in which the Supreme Court limited presidential authority to make recess appointments to the National Labor Relations Board. Roger served in the United States Air Force. He was a staffer to Senator Robert Taft Jr. and subsequently counsel to the Senate Labor Committee. Roger will address the concept of burrowing in in which political appointees become career employees subject to civil service protections from removal. He'll talk about some of the, 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 the recent phenomenon of leaking of government, confidential government information uh, and the comparative challenges that Republican and Democratic administrations face uh, when transitioning into power. So with that, let me turn it over to David for opening remarks. Thank you, John. Um, and thanks very much to the Federalist Society for having me uh, today. It's a, this is a subject that I have been engaged with almost from birth. My dad was a career civil servant in the U.S. government. He started out serving under President Eisenhower and served under Presidents Kennedy, Johnson, Nixon, Ford, and Carter um, across uh, Republican and Democratic administrations alike. And I kind of grew up without anybody ever sort of explaining to me what that was, but sort of um, breathing it in. Um, uh, as, as a kid growing up as to what it meant to serve the country as a, as a civil servant. And then as, a, as an adult in my career, I've, I've had the, the experience, as John said, of serving as a political appointee, both Senate confirmed and in senior staff positions, both at DOD uh, and at DOJ. And so I've, I've both seen uh, the, 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 the really good things about the way uh, agencies operate and some of the challenges um, uh, in, in running these incredibly important institutions uh, and, and in the, some of the, the, the dynamics, both positive and negative, between the political and the career folks. Um, and also, obviously, I'm a keen observer, a very interested one in, in how the government works when I'm not there, uh, since I'm engaged with it in various other ways. So it's a privilege to talk about this. It sort of falls to me, I think, to um, to try to lay out some 
first principles, at least what I view as first principles, um, about kind of how this thing is supposed to work. Um, it's always my experience when tension arises that it's helpful to try to remind myself and or, or ourselves of why we're here actually and what we're, what we're supposed to be doing. So, you know, the first question which, which, which sort of is out there is, you know, who, who, to whom does a government employee owe, um, owe his allegiance, her allegiance? Um, where does that duty lie? Is it the president? Is it the head of the agency? Um, uh, what is it? And, you know, I think fundamentally the starting point is easy for a lawyer, I think, to think about because we're always serving abstractions as lawyers. We have clients. Um, but I think it's true for all government employees, from the president down to, to, the, to the lowest GS3, or if they have GS1s anymore, I don't know. Um, uh, the duty is to the United States government, and that entity's um, interests are defined by law, starting with the Constitution, and then the statutes, and then the regulations that govern the operation of the, of the, of the United States government and its agencies. Um, it's, a, it's an institution that's defined by law. We are, are a government of law and not men or women. Um, and that is a really critically important thing for everybody to remember, whether you're the assistant attorney general for the civil division or a line lawyer in the civil division or an employee uh, uh, anywhere, a, a, a military officer, a, a, a civilian employee of the Defense Department, or the president. Um, uh, the government also, however, like any institution, um, is, is a hierarchical thing. Um, and in the service of those, of, of those interests, uh, it is supposed to run a certain way. There are people who are in charge and people who are responsive to those people who are in charge. And the basic structure of the thing, as John has laid out and as we all know, is that a very small number of people who are politically appointed, who are put in place by the president, and in turn the president himself, are what are called political appointees, and they basically run the place. It's a little more mixed up. There's some overlap. Sometimes you find a political appointee reporting to a career person, and, and that's just um, kind of how it goes sometimes. But generally speaking, the idea is that that, I forget what your numbers were, 99 point something percent of the employees of the government are responsive ultimately to the president, and through them to folks in between, and they're supposed to do what they're told to do by those, by those folks who are their, their bosses, um, subject to the law. Um, it is the job of the bosses to serve the interests of the United States, to set the policy, to figure out how resources are going to be apportioned, and it is the job of the people who work for them, whether they're political appointees or career folks, to do what they're directed to do in a faithful way. Um, I think that's kind of the basics of the thing. Um, I think it's, it's occasionally the case that people tend to forget that. Uh, it's, there are some folks who forget when they're running the agency that their duty is to the law and to the legally defined interests of the agency, that they're supposed to do the things they're empowered to do. They're not supposed to do the things they're prevented from doing. Um, and I think it's occasionally the case that we have career folks who forget that they're supposed to do what they're asked to do. But I think by and large, that's the way um, people on the political side and on the career side view it and how they operate. But I do think then the next question, and maybe the more important one, and probably the more interesting one, is how, does that, how do you make this thing work when people like my father um, are employed across, uh, across uh, administrations with different views, there are policy changes. Um, my dad, um, like as I am, I was a Democrat. Um, he was, you know, enthusiastic about the things that President Johnson was trying to do. He was dismayed by the things that President Nixon was trying to do. Um, he would come home very unhappy during, during the Nixon administration, I can remember that. Um, but he did his job, uh, and you know he thought about quitting at various points. But he had to do his job. But how does that work? You know, how does it work best? And I, I really do think, looking at it, I mean, I was at DOD in the early uh, days of the Clinton administration, and while there were many things where there was a cord between the administration and the military, everybody you know wanted to defend the national security of the United States. It was a very tumultuous time, as as those of you who are um, 
uh, like me, you know, longer in the tooth, will recall because of the, the turmoil around the policy around um, the service by uh, gay people in the military, and, and there, was there was a statute that had been passed that dictated certain aspects of it, but the Clinton administration wanted to change certain things, the way the investigations policy worked, the way recoupment policies worked, other things. It was a very, very heated thing. The military, the senior military leadership at the time was very opposed. Um, I saw it, you know, at the Justice Department, tensions arising where um, sometimes you're just trying to change the way things work. Sometimes you're trying to move a resource from one place to another place where the person who owns the resource doesn't want to give it up. Um, uh, there are a lot of ways in which tension can arise and in which uh, challenges arise. And I do think this idea that John alluded to, this idea of, of trust and transparency, is the basic uh, uh, magic here. It's, you know, it doesn't always work. There are bad apples in every bunch. There are some in the career side. There's some on the political side in every administration. But I think it's the task of the leadership, to, in my view, to create an environment in which the career people, who after all, do all the work. If the government's gonna get anything done, it's gonna get done by the career people. Political people have to do the work. It's going to be a sad day uh, for the country because there aren't very many of them. Um, you, you need to create an atmosphere in which they can tell you what they think. If they disagree with you about what your legal obligations are, about what the policy is, about the way the resources are to be expended, there needs to be an environment in which that can be shared, sometimes with strong feelings. Um, I can recall some meetings where very strong feelings were articulated. But I also recall that after those meetings, when a decision was made and the rules were laid down, whether it was the, the military, which is very good at following orders generally, or the civilian force at the Justice Department, with that kind of engagement, the, the direction generally was followed. Um, it gets harder, obviously, where there's a belief that the leadership's not following the law. It gets harder where there's a belief that the leadership is hostile to the mission of the agency, at least as the career people understand it. Um, uh, but I really think that there's no alternative but to encourage that openness, encourage that exchange, and then insist on, uh, on compliance. Um, the fundamental thing that I believe, and I, I, I hope that everybody who's served, who's really had the experience of serving in the government, shares this view. I really do believe that our career civil servants um, understand, uh, almost all of them, that elections have consequences, that you're obligated to follow lawful direction of your supervisors, that that's your job, and they welcome the opportunity to do that. I think where we get off track sometimes is where they feel disrespected, they feel their opinions aren't important, um, uh, and I think then things can go south. Ted. Well, thank you. I'm proud to be here again today, as I've been uh, a little ashamed to say, but. 33 years an active member of the uh, Federalist Society since I was president at the creation of the student chapter at Stanford Law School. So I'm pleased to be here. Uh, as the only current federal employee, I think it's incumbent on me first to say that uh, I'm speaking only in my personal capacity today and only as to my own personal views and nothing I say should be taken as the views of the U.S. government or the Office of Personnel Management or any other agency. Uh, with that in mind, I propose to just uh, address three points here. Uh, looking to the specific subset of the lawyer as a federal employee, and that would be to focus primarily on the professional ethics of the government lawyer. First, I'm going to talk about how lawyers differ from other federal employees in that regard. Uh, then to consider how career lawyers differ from non-career lawyers in certain respects. And then finally, to conclude with uh, some points on how government lawyers can differ amongst themselves uh, between the, role, the two primary roles of either agency counsel or uh, litigating component roles. So to begin with, we know that lawyers uh, are the same as other federal employees. Uh, they do take the same oath of office uh, that the oath is to the Constitution. Uh, they are agents in a sense of the same principle that is the federal government as a whole and they are in an employer-employee relationship. Where we get in the differences, of course, is where we talk about lawyers as a distinct and learned profession. Um, under this regard, uh, I'm not aware of any instance across the federal government and civil service uh, where a lawyer is anything other than considered the accepted service as opposed to the competitive service of the federal employees, They're meaning that there's no examination for uh, lawyers to be hired. They're 
evaluated on other grounds, but they don't take a formal civil service exam. Um, however, as bar members, and uh, again, I'm talking about uh, employees who are hired as lawyers to perform as lawyers, not necessarily the occasional federal employee who may happen to have a law degree, but it's not required uh, for the position that he holds. And for you uh, technical aficionados, I'm talking about the position description, and it's called the 905 series, and that's the lawyers within the federal government. Uh, so as such, they are members of the bar and uh, therefore required to follow the strictures of the particular legal ethics rules. And for purposes of discussion, I'll be following the ABA model rules, which most bars, I think, uh, adhere closely to or generally. Uh, so a federal lawyer and a government lawyer is going to have the same general duties to his client, uh, duties of competence, duties of diligence, duties to avoid malpractice. And uh, in specific, I think there are two model rules with regard to attorney-client relationships I think we could focus on. The first one is what we call the confidentiality rule, or model rule 1.6, uh, which encompasses entity clients such as the government is considered. Uh, and you have some specific uh, requirements under model rule 1.6. First, there's the duty to keep from disclosing information relating to the representation of the client. Uh, second, there are some limited ex circumstances specified where there can be exceptions to that requirement. Uh, principally those are when one seeks legal advice <coughs> about performing and make, adhering to that same duty. If you're not sure whether you can or can't disclose something, you're allowed to at least disclose to another lawyer whom, from whom you're seeking legal advice about that obligation. Uh, and secondly, there's a general admonition that there are uh, instances where to prevent crime or fraud or serious injury, you may be permitted to disclose. Uh, finally, there's also a, a concomitant duty to make reasonable efforts to prevent the inadvertent or unauthorized disclosures of information related to the uh, representation. So all of these are, again, is the same obligation as private lawyers, lawyers in private practice outside the government are subject to, but um, in the government context, there's a response to uh, some of these requirements of disclosure. They're constrained to different channels. Um, you have to keep it within the government uh, and, and the uh, statutory requirements. If you're not reporting directly in your uh, chain at your agency, then uh, there are statutory whistleblower processes. Uh, that would be either through the Inspector General's offices or the Office of Special Counsel, uh, or uh, in certain circumstances to Congress, congressional committees with the oversight. Uh, but you're limited only to those, and anything else would be a, an improper violation of your legal ethics. Uh, the client, as we said, is the thing of government, and it's not a particular official, it's not the particular agency head, but it's always to the, the government. Um, and the attorney-client privilege exists, but it cannot be invoked as against another part of the government. Typically, that means that it can't be invoked against grand jury subpoenas, criminal investigations, and the like. Uh, but we will also see that it also does not shield the information from most congressional oversight committees, because uh, in many situations, Congress will generally consider themselves to be the client. Um, you're also forbidden on using client information for your own purposes, uh, regardless of whether it causes any detriment to uh, the client or the government. Uh, it's just not uh, proper ethical uh, behavior on behalf of that client, that uh, attorney, I'm sorry. The second rule under the model rules in the attorney-client relationship is the having the organizational as a client under uh, model rule point one. 1.13, uh, and again, this includes government as an entity, uh, much uh, analogous and similar to the rules that apply to people who are employed by entities such as corporations and businesses. Uh, comment nine to that rule specifically applies the rule to government organizations, but as we've already adverted to, the difficulty is determining who is the client. There's a broader sense scope of saying the people in the Constitution as a whole are the client, uh, you could take it down to, say, the executive branch or the legislative branch for whom you may be working as the client or down to the specific agency. Uh, the rule itself says that, or the comment, I should say, uh, although in some circumstances the client may be a specific agency, it is generally the government as a whole. Uh, this being the legal ethical position, it doesn't necessarily uh, eliminate the other context, the practical or the policy considerations where you're going to have institutional tensions between agencies competing to determine a policy within the executive branch, and you have the separation of powers concerns between the executive branch and their deliberative process and the legislative branch and their desire for oversight. Uh, 
As a footnote to that, you might note that in the 1997, there was an ABA formal opinion that said that this comment nine, uh, and the quote I just gave you is not dispositive. Uh, and in that case, they say there should be a proposed functional analysis looking at exactly who you're representing and to what purpose. But when you read it closer, it's really largely relevant in the context of outside lawyers and law firms who are engaged uh, for specific counsel and discrete matters, usually by a state or local government entity. Though there are occasions, I believe, where the DOJ in the past has perhaps hired outside counsel. Uh, and in those cases, you have a, a potential conflict situation where that outside counsel law firm may have other clients in other matters that are substantively unrelated to what they're doing for the government, but could in the abstract pose a potential conflict. So they propose under the ABA opinion that there be a uh, functional analysis to see whether they're truly related or just uh, separate coexisting uh, representations. But uh, to return to our focus here on the federal employees, a full-time employee of a U.S. government agency is presumed and expected to uh, work solely for their agency in the U.S. government. So it's not really going to be uh, uh, all that relevant, I think, though it's a potential. Uh, the duties are usually uh, focused on the constituent acts in the areas of the matters of their legal representation. Uh, however, uh, that also means, conversely, a federal employee or lawyer should not necessarily feel he has a roaming uh, warrant to uh, uh, re research or, or reveal things that are necessarily outside his work area, his relevant representation. Uh, as our friend, the late Professor Ron Rotondo, has quoted uh, in writing, he said, there is no general obligation for a lawyer to be an officious intermeddler. <laughs> uh, my second point to talk about the distinction between career and non-career lawyers. Uh, I think the principal distinction from the point of view of looking at the civil service is really just how they're hired and fired, who has protections under the civil service. Uh, as I said, both instances are considered accepted service. Uh, but the uh, career lawyers would be uh, generally competed and evaluated for the openings they apply for uh, in their interviews. Uh, the career leadership, uh, uh, I'm sorry, career leadership is the type that would be competed. Uh, but what we call non-career or more colloquially political lawyers, or political appointees who happen to be lawyers or in a lawyer's position uh, are either going to be Schedule C hiring, as it's called technically, or uh, senior executives. And they're typically done by interview through the presidential personnel system, the presidential personnel office, or in certain cases with uh, departmental general counsels, they can be presidentially appointed, Senate confirmed. Um, so uh, in both in terms of the tenure, of course, uh, political uh, non-career lawyers are generally not expected to stay longer than the uh, duration of the administration in which they're hired. Uh, they also lack the career procedural protections, such as the right of appeal to the Merit Systems Protection Board review of any disciplinary actions uh, uh, all the way through the federal circuit, and that generally attaches to a career hire after one year on the job. Uh, a non-career, conversely, uh, just basically serves at the pleasure of the president or his, his uh, delegated uh, managers. Uh, functionally, you're going to have a slight difference in policy-making roles and uh, senior leadership responsibilities. More of those will be with the non-career lawyers. Uh, but as uh, David had mentioned, there are cases, uh, certainly within the Department of Justice as well as other agencies, where you'll have uh, both uh, senior uh, career as well as senior non-career lawyers uh, combining in that role. Uh, in my experience with uh, GOP Republican administrations, conservative administrations tend to follow what we call the unitary executive doctrine, the approach to uh, uniformly uh, further the president's agenda as uh, cooperating members of the same executive branch all under the president's command. Uh, but even so, all are still subject to the ethics rules and uh, the essential higher duty to follow and advise on the law uh, as they go about furthering the president's agenda. So on my third and final point, uh, to turn to the differing roles uh, as to agency counsel and uh, litigating components, who basically uh, agency counsel would be those lawyers who serve to advise uh, uh, within agencies that uh, do not have independent authority to go into the courts or the other tribunals to litigate. Uh, and that's going to have a wide vari variation of duties, whether that's review or assistance or oversight of agency actions, regulations. Uh, Sometimes the concerns about litigation risk, but also including uh, clarity, consistency with administration policy and precedent. Uh, those are the typical agency council roles. 
there to know and advise the uh, general parameters of the law and the statute is the outer bounds or constraints, uh, as well as the mandatory aspects of the law that uh, say what must be done and what otherwise is chosen or implemented as the policy. So that's their role within the leadership for the policy determinations of the agencies. They will also act in coordination and assistance with the DOJ as the preliminary litigating component of the government uh, in representing both the agency and the government as a whole. Uh, and for that matter, then the other side of the coin is the litigating attorneys in DOJ and other litigating entities where they have a specific focus on investigations, prosecution, litigations in the court and certain other tribunal proceedings. And uh, they would fall under the uh, model rule number three, which deals with all the possible uh, permutations and conduct of a lawyer as an advocate, uh, particularly in court and tribunals, and there are other dis tenant disciplinary rules for that. Uh, within the DOJ, the DOJ lawyers also have the added resources of uh, professional responsibility, off advisory office, PREO, and the Office of Professional Responsibility, OPR. Uh, those are specialized centers of knowledge and discipline in those areas to help keep them out of trouble and maintain their ethical duties under Rule 3. Uh, and these are the principal uh, highlights I wanted to bring out as to the uh, distinctions between types and uh, categories of uh, federal lawyers. And with that, I think I've uh, hopefully set it up for a good segue and a handoff to Stuart to uh, discuss further within that area. Thank you very much. Um, it's, uh, it's great to be here with uh, all the colleagues up here and with all of you. So um, echo uh, what others have said. and. and uh, thanking us for the opportunity. Um, I, uh, I should say that uh, David Ogden is responsible for my uh, opportunity at the Justice Department. I, I first went there uh, to work for him uh, when he was the Deputy Attorney General. And um, I think you've, you've heard a couple of mentions of transitions already. Um, I, I'll add my own uh, because I, I actually started ahead of David uh, on Inauguration Day in 2009 and was one of the probably missed John by a day um, <laughs> uh, on, the, on the way out, and, and was one of the, you know, the small group, I think there were about a dozen of us before Attorney General Holder was confirmed, before any, um, uh, any of the other uh, Senate confirmed officials uh, were there, um, who began the task of uh, figuring out um, how the Justice Department would work um, in this new administration. Um, and in doing that, uh, worked day in and day out with the uh, senior career lawyers who were then the acting heads of all of the DOJ components, um, a number of whom um, are, are legends, really, uh, within the department and, and within the government. And so it was a very interesting introduction to the department um, and to some of the issues that we'll uh, be talking about here today. Um, I think you're going to find some uh, variations on common themes among all of us as, as we talk about this. Um, I thought I would share uh, some further observations on the subject uh, of exactly how DOJ and other government lawyers go about identifying and then furthering the interests of the United States. Um, and I come at that from the perspective of somebody who spent a lot of time during my uh, time in government um, trying to determine the positions of, that the United States should take in litigation um, and to, in some cases, resolve disputes uh, internally within the government on what cases to bring or settle and, and what arguments to make and the like. Um, and, you know, th this issue really arises because, uh, as has already been said, like, like all lawyers, the touchstone for government lawyers is what's in the best interest of the client. And for government lawyers, as we've said, the, the client is the United States. Um, but identifying those interests and, and then figuring out what to do about them is often more complicated than might be the case uh, when representing a private individual or even a company, even a large one. Um, DOJ cases usually um, involve the actions of a particular part of the government, client, uh, a cabinet agency that sometimes gets referred to as the client agency. And certainly the department affords weight to the views of that agency based on its expertise and institutional history and understanding of the legal framework uh, that it's operating under. Um, as the lawyers at DOJ work to formulate the position of the United States in a given case. Um, but the agency that happens to have been sued might not be the only agency or even the principal agency with an interest in whatever the legal question 
is uh, that's really at stake. And this is one of the main reasons, I think, why the Attorney General has been given the uh, general control, uh, for, control for the most part, of the federal government's litigation. And it's really so that DOJ lawyers uh, can take the long view, uh, evaluate the long-term institutional interests of the United States and conduct litigation accordingly, and also look beyond the particular case or agency um, that's involved, uh, or, and really beyond what a particular official, who might be the one talking to you about the case, um, might want to do. Um, and consistency is obviously also important. Um, obviously, um, there, there ought to be consistency where possible, and a, a single agency's desires can't and don't necessarily determine uh, government-wide litigation interest. Um, and so to inform this process, and inform these legal judgments and litigation judgments, um, the Department of Justice consults widely um, within the department and across the government um, in what's sometimes called the interagency, as John referred to, um, to so solicit views on, uh, particularly on no novel legal questions. Um, and uh, where there are disagreements, which is frequently the case, to bring the stakeholders together to talk about them and, and to figure out um, what the path forward should be. And so that means that on a, on a daily basis, really, uh, lawyers from across the government are talking to each other um, and working to ensure that various and often disagreeing voices are heard um, to try to forge consensus where consensus is possible um, and to then tee up for decision uh, questions uh, that can't be resolved through consensus. So I confess that I hadn't really given much thought to how this process would work before I started at DOJ. It, it makes sense, logically, that there would have to be a process to corral these competing interests, but um, you know, I, I really didn't have a, a, a sense of the texture of how this process works until that time. Um, and I also think that this, this story of this deliberative process is one that's not often heard about the government. Um, that, uh, that different agencies or parts of agencies with different missions and with different interests, um, with different mandates, um, different legal uh, requirements, maybe different understandings of the law, um, are working together to work through these hard questions. Um, but it's a, it's, it really is a process that um, everyone representing the government at DOJ takes very seriously um, and to make, really to make sure that issues are raised and uh, um, debates are had where they, ne where they need to be had uh, and that the, uh, then a decision is reached. Um, and I do think uh, that f you know, as a non-career or political appointee in the government, um, I, I think that the process was better. The decision making was better. Uh, fewer mistakes were made uh, because of the robustness of this process. Um, and obviously the uh, non-career officials, the political appointees who headed the various offices, as David mentioned, um, were uh, principal voices in all of these discussions, but they're not the only ones. And, and the career lawyers, uh, both at DOJ and in the other agencies brought, um, in my experience, invaluable perspective to bear. Um, institutional perspectives, a sense of history. Um, uh, you know, I, I often said that in almost every office at DOJ, there are, um, you know, real uh, uh, repositories of institutional uh, history and memory um, that are, are frankly national treasures. You know, they're, they're people who know everything that ever happened uh, in a particular area and can tell you off the top of their head. Uh, you know, and so from, from, a, uh, from the perspective of political appointees, this process, you know, um, was really a, a, an occasion to avoid stumbling into errors. And I do think that that's, this is one of the reasons why I think um, that the, uh, you know, attacks uh, to the extent that they're made on the motivations of, of career lawyers uh, at the department and across the government um, are, are troubling and not in the interest of the United States as a whole because, um, uh, you know, I think I always viewed my part, part of my job as a member of the leadership of the department um, as protecting uh, 
uh, the career lawyers, giving them the space to do their jobs, and in particular, um, the space to give the candid advice um, that we wanted to hear. Um, and I certainly didn't uh, agree always uh, with the recommendations of the career lawyers. I didn't when I worked at DOJ, um, certainly don't, uh, when I'm uh, representing a client in private practice either. Um, and you know, it's also interesting that the career lawyers don't all agree with each other uh, frequently. Frequently they don't. Um, they're also not autonomous for the reasons that uh, David alluded to. Um, so to take DOJ as an example, at, at the department, the authority, uh, almost without exception, is vested in the Attorney General. And so everybody else there is exercising delegated authority in one form or another. And it means that then there's a hierarchy of decision-making authority. There's a legal framework for the principle that David talked about that, uh, that the leaders of the various offices and ultimately the leaders of the department where an issue bubbles up um, actually get to decide. And um, I had the same experience, which is that that's, that's widely understood and shared. Um, in my experience, the key issue being um, have people had an opportunity to be heard? Had an op have they had an opportunity to share the perspectives that they bring to bear, often the history? Um, and you know, if they do, uh, then, uh, you know, I think not only are people willing to execute the decisions of the administration um, that might uh, be providing leadership at, at any particular time, um, but generally, uh, you know, consistent with the legal framework that David alluded to, view it as their job to do that. And, and even if they disagree, we'll set about bringing the experience that they have to bear um, in order to, to execute. So um, from my perspective, uh, I, I will say I'm probably on the more positive side of the spectrum that uh, John alluded to um, at, at the beginning. Um, but, I, but I actually think that um, if, if people saw this process in operation, if the public could see the process in operation, um, it would actually have the effect of promoting rather than undermining confidence in government and the decision making. Um, in my experience, the, the legal analysis was um, incredibly impressive. The discussions were thorough. Um, I, rare, I, I rarely, maybe almost never felt like by the time a decision was being made at the end, you know, by the Attorney General or, um, or me as, as a subsidiary officer, um, that there was some critical piece of information, some, uh, some angle, some uh, legal issue that had not been explored. And really, that is because of the work of, of the career lawyers in this process. <clears throat> Thanks, Stuart. Yeah. Roger. Thanks. Uh, I also greatly appreciate the opportunity to be here. Always joining the Federalist Society in a discussion is, I think, quite productive and thought-provoking. So I think it's a very difficult time to be a government lawyer. Uh, put aside your political beliefs and how you feel about this administration. A lot of challenges. So my, my background is the legislative branch, being a government lawyer uh, in the Senate. And they're somewhat like the Game of Thrones. I think you figure out what's going on and you have a duty of loyalty to whoever you're working for. I think that's fairly clear cut, uh, not too difficult. But some general observations before I get into uh, some specifics. Uh, numerosity, the number of government lawyers in this town uh, and former government lawyers uh, is substantial, as we all know. Uh, I was at a Nats game last summer talking to a vendor and just chatting with him generally. He said, oh, I just used to work for the SEC. I was an enforcement lawyer. <laughs> I don't know if it's a step up or step down for that vendor. But uh, government lawyers or former government lawyers are everywhere. Uh, second, the uh, intellectual capacity uh, of the legal community in this town, I would submit, uh, perhaps the best in the world. Uh, and I'll do deference to my colleagues in New York or London, uh, the repository of knowledge on virtually any legal subject in this town uh, never ceases to impress me. You can find a lawyer that has a background in her or his uh, practice area uh, that abounds, and I agree with you. The repository is uh, quite <coughs> substantial. Uh, that said, I think our legal ethics are being tested uh, continually 
uh, and the legal community working for government service or in government service. Uh, frankly, I'm a little jaundiced. Uh, when I came here from law school, I uh, remember my ethics uh, courses been alluded to previously, duty of loyalty, confidentiality. And I often think, is that duty of loyalty and confidentiality to a particular media outlet or a particular reporter within that media outlet? Uh, where is the duty of loyalty and confidentiality, uh, particularly in this day and age in this community? I think it's something we need to uh, re-examine. Well, back to my experience and some, some concluding thoughts. As I said, I think the legislative branch government lawyer uh, working in the legislative arena, fairly easy to put your bounds or establish the bounds and understand what your obligations are. When you start to interact uh, with executive uh, departments and lawyers representing the executive departments, put aside DOJ, which I think is a bit of an outlier, frankly. Uh, gentlemen, I think DOJ's responsibilities and duties are a bit different than perhaps some of the other government uh, legal community issues that we deal with. But when you start dealing with executive branch agencies, departments, independent agencies, uh, frankly, it's a challenge. Uh, again, the repository of uh, knowledge is considerable. Experience is great. Uh, the inflexibility factor, though, I think is frustrating uh, to many of us in this room or many on this panel. Uh, we've done it this way forever. We're going to continue to do it this way. And that's the way it is. You try to persuade me otherwise, good luck. Um, a lot of my colleagues currently in this town are having that experience. And, and my perspective is particularly in what I would call the people agencies, uh, the Department of Labor, uh, the EEOC, the National Labor Relations Board, maybe to a lesser extent, uh, DOJ Civil Rights Division. Uh, trying to make movement on policy. I'm assuming that movement within policy is legal, ethical, moral, uh, but it's a different perspective. Uh, is a considerable challenge. Uh, Burring in was, was mentioned uh, earlier. Is, is it uh, consistent with a lawyer's duty of loyalty to burrow in uh, to an incoming administration if you have strongly held views completely opposite of, or at least to a certain extent opposite of the incoming administration? I think that's a substantial question to ask. And, and one a lawyer, I think, should think very deeply about before she or he attempts to so-called burrow in. A couple other thoughts, uh, particularly in this, this community at this point in time. Do we have enough political appointee lawyers? Uh, I submit perhaps not. And, and this, this would go for a Democrat or a Republican administration. Uh, when you look at what's going on in the Senate, and this, again, put aside your partisan uh, viewpoint. What it's going to take at the current pace 60 years to get through our current uh, nominees or potential nominees, uh, the ability to effectuate change, and elections do have consequences, hopefully, uh, is a substantial problem. And it's going to be a problem for the Democrat Party, the Republican Party, and for uh, the government as a whole, and most importantly, for the people. So do we need to have more people coming in uh, that are not in the civil service system and then can effectuate policy quicker? I think that's a legitimate uh, question to ask and one I know that is on the minds of many people in this community at present. Uh, let, let me conclude by a, a partisan analysis and I, I submit it as partisan, uh, but as a Republican over the years and I've been in and out of Washington for 40 some years. Uh, I really submit that I believe a Republican administration has a much more difficult time in effectuating policy change uh, through the legal community and otherwise. And just a couple of uh, stats to support that statement. If you look at the voter registration uh, analysis, whether it be in the District of Columbia, Northern Virginia, or Maryland, uh, obviously heavy D, or becoming even heavier. Uh, Democrat. Uh, second, if you look at the voting exit poll analyses of voters in this area, many of whom are government lawyers, uh, it's heavily D versus R. When you put on top of that an agenda that wants to diminish the size of government or diminish the number of rules and regulations, uh, that's contra uh, to the uh, 
uh, already committed established practice of that particular agency or department in large part, at least some of the civil service government attorneys. Now, having said all that, I don't want my remarks to be misunderstood. There are tremendously talented people, ethical people in this town uh, of both parties or any party. And there are really very, very talented civil servants. But I, I submit to you, I think we have a problem uh, in our legal community and government as a whole of effectuating policy change. And we really need, I think, to re-examine how we're going about that process. And I'll stand by that statement if we have a Democrat president uh, sitting in the White House in 2020. So let me conclude with that. Thank you, Roger. Well, picking up on, on what Roger just, uh, just ended with, uh, when a new president comes into office with, uh, with a new agenda, uh, sometimes there are aspects of that that are embraced. Um, Roger, you suggested that, uh, that, that oftentimes that there's um, some resistance that emerges, uh, perhaps more so in Republican administrations than, than Democratic administrations. But just t let's take a step back. In your experience, uh, and this is for the entire panel, how much of the resistance to a new president's agenda is due to inertia, that is just resistance to change, as opposed to ideology that is perhaps resistance to you know, a particular philosophy. And you can go in any order, Roger, do you want to start off? Well, I, I would agree that it, the inertia, we've done it this way forever. This is the way uh, we put the regs in place. I helped draft the regs or I was involved and that's the way it is. So no, I, I think irrespective of whether you're a DNR or an I, uh, that's there. Um, I, I, I think, and I, I don't have any, um, study and analytical support for this, but my sense is that we've become more, such, more and more partisan in this town. Particularly, I know that's true in the, in the House and the Senate, that's obvious. But I, I think the partisanship, whether it be in the judicial branch or now in the executive branch, has become so intense that the resistance to policy change, uh, it appears to me, has increased. So, do you wanna? I mean, I guess my sense of it is, I mean, I, 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 I'm sure it's true just as a matter of demographics that there are significantly more um, U.S. government employees who lean Democratic than Republican. I think that's probably a uh, common understanding. But I do th also know that um, the vast majority of government employees, as I said earlier, understand what their role is, and um, and so while I think that's a fair, some of the resistance is policy related, um, uh, and they have views, and they're going to articulate their views. Um, I think this process that we've talked about of engagement um, is critical to addressing these issues um, and getting effectively. Uh, uh, everybody pulling in the in the same direction. I I, I do think um, uh, part of the resistance you call it you can call it inertia, but it's also the case that a new incoming administration, Democratic or Republican, um, has a lot of people that have never done this before. <laughs> uh, you know that was true for me when I showed up at the Defense Department as a as a in my early 40s to be Deputy General Counsel. Um, I'd never been in the government before. I never uh, had a lot of exposure to the military. Um, I didn't know a darn thing about what is truly the most complicated bureaucracy on the face of the earth. Still not sure I understand it. Um, uh, but you know it's true when you come back to the Justice Department, even having served there before where I had a big leg up. And you know, some people think they know it all. Um, and I think uh, some humility on the part of an in, in incoming administration is awfully important. I mean, I hope when we engage with you um, as, as the incoming Obama administration at the Justice Department, sort of the first question was, what's going on? Help us understand uh, what the issues are. We have a common interest in running this government and this, and this department. Let's, let's, it, let's come to it with some humility. And I do think that goes a long way. In the end, you get to make the decision, but listen. And I think that, 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 that helps. There's some, before you tear down a fence, figure out why it's there. I mean, there's just some basic principles, and I do think that when you're thinking about change, 
it makes sense to approach it with, a, with, with some humility. Um, just to add uh, uh, one or two things. One, one is, I don't think, uh, you know, d despite the um, sort of voter registration uh, differences that people are making decisions uh, within the government for partisan political reasons. Um, uh, you know, I, I think people will say that they don't, and I think for the most part that, uh, in my experience, is true. Um, I do think, though, and, and again, whether you call this inertia or something else, um, where, uh, from a policy perspective, an incoming administration's goal for a particular agency or office is to scale it back dramatically, um, which, I think uh, along our current political dynamic will not be evenly distributed uh, between the parties. Um, I, I do think part of the inertia is you've got a whole bunch of people, um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm positing, who um, think that they are good at what they do. Um, and if you're not talking about changing policy among what they do, but um, really, you know, eliminating, so, you know, some or much of of what they do, um, I think that that is probably more likely to generate some, uh, an, you know, inertia or um, uh, internal uh, questioning and, and opposition. And so that may be a reason why the uh, effect is experienced um, differently, uh, depending on what the goals are of the incoming administration. Well, it's human nature to be comfortable to stay in the status quo. You'll often hear, well, this is the way we've always done it. But uh, an agency council is incumbent to say, well, that's not necessarily justification for continuing to do it. You may have been doing it incorrectly for some time. And that's why you're often called upon to say, well, show me the statute. What, what are we talking about? Because this is the best uh, role. I think one of the prominent roles of the agency council is to say, well, here, here are the, the lines on the road for you to follow. You have to do this under the law. You can't do that under the law. And everything in between is where you have the, the room to maneuver for policy choices. Uh, I, I found that quite often uh, it's not so much career versus non-career, but sometimes it's uh, uh, lawyer versus non-lawyer. Um, sure. Some of the career lawyers I've gotten to know uh, I got a little frustrated with the non-lawyers who either avoid or don't want to listen to the lawyers who they determine are always going to tell them no. Um, and I think that's sort of endemic uh, both in government and private practice. You have a client that doesn't necessarily want to hear the answer to the question. Um, and that's something we all deal with. And that's why I think Roger was right to mention that DOJ is something of an outlier. I mean, DOJ is unique. It's a fairly concentrated community of uh, well-qualified attorneys. So. You all speak the same language. We have some of the same training. Uh, I found it was slightly different and occasionally refreshing to be uh, one of the few lawyers in another agency where there are a lot of non-lawyers. If you're on a good day, they'll show you some deference. And, you know, you're one of those priests of the received knowledge. We don't know the law, but we know you'll tell us. Uh, and that, that's kind of nice. So I, I said on a good day. There are plenty of it I said the other days where they just don't want to hear what you have to say and you have to uh, <clears throat> make sure you're on the record. Um, but uh, like I said, most of that is, is somewhat to be expected. It's in human nature. It's also the institutional nature of it. Uh, it's part of what we do as both people and lawyers and judging the, uh, the context and the people we're working with. Well, to pick up on a point that, uh, that Stuart referenced, uh, Stuart and, and David and I all have a lot of experience with uh, the civil division. And it seems to me that perhaps some positions more naturally transition from one administration to the next. So, for example, in the civil division, uh, if you're a government attorney whose job it is to defend uh, the prerogatives of the executive branch, uh, those prerog what, what, how those prerogatives are being exercised may change, but your mission fundamentally hasn't changed. Whereas in other agencies and other offices that are perhaps more policy driven, a change of administration can have more dramatic consequences. Share some thoughts on, on those differences. And does that mean that the political appointees should take a different role in dealing with those types of components and those types, those groups of government employees? Well, I, I, just would, I just would add, I think we could add to that outlier list on, per your question. Uh, maybe the Department of Defense, you know, maybe the Postal Service. There, there are a number of executive departments, agencies, where policy day-to-day decision-making is not on the forefront, it seems to me. Um, 
or if it is, we have much more established policy, much more consistent from one administration to another. So, so I think the real challenge is we could go to the EPA, suppose the NLRB, to a certain extent DOL. There I think the government lawyer really has a um, greater challenge where you have a policy push uh, and a resistance level. But just my thought from uh, the outside. John, I think a classic example of what really doesn't change substantively is uh, the, the criminal enforcement, the U.S. Attorney's offices. And I, I should say to Roger, when he talks about burrowing in, I think the phrase is, I resemble that remark. <laughs> uh, I've been both career and non-career, have gone back and forth, in particular when I left a non-career position in the Bush administration at the Deputy Attorney General's office. It was to take a career position as a prosecutor in the U.S. Attorney's office in the Southern District of Florida. And I was there for both the second half of the uh, Bush administration and all of the Obama administration. And day to day, uh, you're not making policy as a line AUSA. You're enforcing the law and taking the cases the investigative law enforcement agencies bring to you. Now, there may be shifts in emphasis between administrations about where they're going to emphasize whether right. it's going to be more of a violent crime or, or drug emphasis or it's going to be more on illegal immigration or maybe more on the white collar crime and so forth. Um, but those aren't necessarily policy driven. Sometimes they could be resource driven or they could just be driven by the headlines. Um, but your day to day job as a, a prosecutor is pretty much the same dealing with the issues of what's brought before you. Um, the, the, the difference, I think, is, uh, uh, as you said, in the other agencies when you're there. Um, the, the pollsters often, I think, say that uh, most everyone dislikes Congress, but everybody votes to return their own particular congressman. You know, they they right. like the guy who's rep or, girl or woman who's representing them. Um, I think you can make an analogy to uh, uh, politicals or non-careers when we go into the the agency, everybody will come, might come in, at least in a Republican administration, with a certain suspicion about what, what are the careers and their attitude. But uh, once you get to your agency, you tend to like your careers. They're there to help you. you know? so, like you said, the institutional memory. So, so, Ted, I just want to go on record. I wasn't questioning your loyalty by burrowing in at all. <laughs> uh, and I, I don't define what you did as burrowing in. I, I would limit that definition to attempting to continue to effectuate policy contra to the incoming Oh, believe me, I did not take it that way. All right. All right. I was just seizing the opportunity to speak from personal experience. Uh, well, it's always I, good to talk about something I, I actually know about. And I do think often this, the stats about um, burrowing in are sweeping in uh, the, TED, uh, the, the TEDs out there. Um, I think very often what you're talking about are younger folks who've had an opportunity to serve the government in one administration and want the opportunity to serve it in a career position, and they just go and and do that, and um, I think it's often a much more benign thing than it's, than it's characterized. I think it's relatively unusual for somebody to burrow in in the sense that they're gonna be sort of a mole or something like that. I'm not familiar with many of those kinds of things. I mean, I think it's surely the case um, that it's easier um, from, a, from, from, from the perspective of kind of getting everybody pulling the sled in the same direction if you're running a, an institution like the civil division, that we've had that, shared that experience, than running an institution like, say, the civil rights division, um, you know, within the Justice Department, to name two institutions that, that I've had some involvement with in different capacities, um, for precisely the reasons you say. The civil division's job is to defend what Congress passes, what the administration does, um, and the slip and fall cases, you know, that, that happen and, and everything in between and you're a lawyer and you're doing a job and you're defending a client and that's what you do. Um, and I think the cases are a little different in a Republican administration than a Democratic one. You're defending a policy that's a different policy um, sometimes, but Congress is always lobbying in other things. And I do think when you're running an organization like the Civil Rights Division, which has a, um, an affirmative mission uh, to advance a certain set of policies, when there are very different views between the political parties about how to go about doing that, what, what um, what civil rights mean, um, you know, that kind of change can be a big deal and add to that ramping down an agency in the way that Stuart's talking about and people don't like to have their friends put out of work or to be out of work themselves. So there's a, I think there are many, many more challenges on that side of things, just it's, an, it's the, the, the nature of it. Right. Um, I'll just add that, I, you know, I do think it becomes a management challenge um, and at least anecdotally it seems to me that, um, you know, across administrations, if you 
you know, go back to the Clinton administration, which was sort of my uh, entry into the into the legal world, and, and looking at the change now through a couple of cycles. Obviously, the, the Civil Rights Division has had a, a tough time at DOJ. There's been a lot of friction documented at length in published reports. Um, others, uh, where there, is, there are also policy differences between the parties, have, have um, you know, sailed through the storm, you know, or, or through the, the changing tides uh, more smoothly. And I think that's a result of, um, you know, management uh, providing the kinds of transparency and opportunities to be heard that, that David talked about. So I, I think that there are, there are ways to manage through policy change uh, that can make the process uh, easier or harder, depending on how you approach it. Let me tee up one more topic, and then we'll open it up to, to questions from the audience after that. Um, again, picking up on, on some of the points you just made, Stuart, and something that, David, you had said earlier uh, on the, the idea of, of trust and the development of a, of a relationship between the, the career and the political appointees. Uh, what do government employees do? What's appropriate for them to do if they vehemently disagree with the direction of agency decision-making or policy? Uh, and to put not too fine a point on it, um, to what extent is it ever appropriate for government employees to make their case outside the confines of the deliberative process, i.e. in the press, to oversight committees, or otherwise going outside the, the chain of command? Don't all speak at once. I think it's, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I think it's, you know, obviously a, a really important and difficult uh, I think it's a very difficult question. I think it's extraordinarily unusual when it's appropriate, uh, if, it, if, if it ever is, um, for a current government employee to, to, to do that. I, I think the hardest lines that exist are around what's, what's legal or not legal. I think if, you, if you're in any organization, whether it's the government or a corporation or a, or a law firm, um, and you believe that what's going on around you is illegal, um, I think that changes your calculus in, in some ways. I think the first obligation is to raise your views uh, within the organization um, in the most effective way you know how to do. Um, I think if you feel that your views are not welcome or um, have been rejected and you think the course is still an unlawful course, then I think there's the question, do you resign? I think that's obviously a first uh, a first thing to think about, but then what is your obligation to tell somebody about it, and who do you tell? Um, do you just keep it to yourself, or do you, or do you tell somebody? And I, and I think the idea that you're not supposed to tell anybody um, uh, is probably not right uh, if you feel that, that that's going on. I think that's an extraordinarily unusual situation, but I think it's, uh, it's, it's one that where I would see a, a potential for the, an exception. I think where, you, where, you, where it gets very troubling and where I think you see it happen, a lot, and I've seen it in Democratic and Republican administrations, is where the fiefdoms of government um, get engaged and you've got a situation of the kind that Stuart's talking about where one's getting downsized or there's a, there's a view by one organization that they're not being treated appropriately or what have you. Um, they're not getting the right funding, they need this or that, and off they go to the hill to, to back channel. Um, uh, that happens constantly in, in government, and it's frustrating as can be for the executive branch, or at the extreme to a, to a to press organization, and they're disclosing stuff that they shouldn't be disclosing. And I think, by and large, with the exception of the legal issues that I was talking about, I think, in my view, uh, that's inappropriate. I think, in general, you're given a direction that you don't agree with. Your choice is either to carry it out or to quit. Um, and. Uh, and, that, and, that, and I think everybody in the government really understands that's the deal. It's not such an easy, uh, it's not such an easy rule, uh, but, but it's the right way to go and as a general matter. So I, I would concur. I mean, those of us in our private practice experiences, if we've had difficulty with a client, we have objections to the actions of the client, uh, it's the client's morals, it's ethics, it's lack of veracity, uh, we take steps to sever the relationship. Uh, we may need permission of the court, obviously, depending on the extent of representation. And after that, however, we have a duty of confidentiality. We don't discuss uh, 
uh, what went on in that representation. And it would occur to me that would be the same role that a government lawyer should take if she or he uh, does not believe in what the policy is, cannot effectuate the policy. Uh, uh, that person should step aside, but uh, should uh, certainly uh, have a degree of confidence in what they did uh, in their government role. I think we've got time for a question or two from the audience. Yes, there's a, and there's a microphone right there behind you. So that way we can hear you and, and everyone else can too. Good morning for a few more minutes. Uh, my name is Mohammed. Uh, by disclosure, I'm a 905 attorney, but here in my individual capacity. Uh, I was wondering if you could address the issue of leaks under this administration further. I think it's symptomatic of some of the um, issues related to um, resistance to the current administration and whether, you know, there seems to be a culture of, you know, partisan resistance. And I think that feeds into the perception of a more negative view of civil servants that, you know, John O'Quinn mentioned that there might be a more negative view of them or a positive view. Uh, can you just talk more about the leaks? Because I think that's one of the most egregious things a civil servant would do. Um, because as Mr. Ogden said, you know, if someone doesn't like what they're doing, they should just quit. You know, they're not entitled to that job. They're, need, they're there to do their job as re reflected by the will of the voters. I will start. Take it. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I mean, I I, I agree that um, the uh, you know I had that experience. I think everybody who's had that experience in government of of you know sort of being in a meeting or a decision making process and then seeing it all recounted uh, in great detail, um, often surprisingly accurate detail. Uh, it you know has an effect on the decision making process, and so uh, you know I I do think that that's a um, that's a real challenge. I, I agree with David that the the appropriate response is to, um, you know, figure out whether you, uh, consistent with your obligations, can do your job or not, and then uh, and then decide accordingly. I will say about leaks. I mean, there are others here or, or out there who may be better at divining the likely source of uh, information in uh, in articles than I am. But um, it, you know, in, I'm not sure that. Uh, there are often lots of possible sources for information that, that appear in articles. Um, and you know, maybe sometimes uh, they're uh, civil servants, and uh, that is troubling for the reasons uh, that have been discussed. Um, not clear uh, in a lot of what's happened over the last uh, year plus that, in, in my view, those are the most likely sources for a, a fair amount let of me, Let me put a little bit of a less fine point on that. Um, you know, if you've been around this town, uh, as long as I have anyway, and probably you don't even have to have been around <laughs> that long, I, the principal reason leaks happen, in, in my opinion, um, uh, is that pe there's somebody with a personal agenda that uh, they are seeking to advance, l much less than a political agenda. It's, it, it, it's some, they, they, they want to be portrayed in a certain way they want somebody else to be portrayed in a certain way. They want to have some impact on their reputations or somebody else's reputations for personal reasons. And I think <coughs> my sideline view uh, of what's going on now is that the overwhelming majority of leaks that are happening now are driven by that, um, both from the political and non-political side. I, I, I think that's lamentable. I think it's as probably indefensible as any reason for leaking to take place. I think it has a corrosive, corrosive effect on the way an institution works. But I just think it's happened from, for, it's maybe worse now, but I've seen it from the inside. I, I've seen, you know, really, really, really sensitive things. I mean, sometimes it's like who said what in a meeting and it's all about personality. But sometimes it's, you know, it can be classified information. It can be very, very sensitive information that actually affects the interests of the United States, not just um, people's feelings. And that's really terrible when that becomes uh, the consequence of, of those kinds of personal agendas. But I do think it's, I mean, you know, I may lead a, a somewhat 
charmed existence because I think the, the, our experience, maybe for some of the reasons I've been talked about, was different, perhaps. But I, I do think that tends to be the reason more than a kind of a, um, you know, resistance effort um, from the career levels. I mean, that's debatable, but that's my view. I think we might have time for one more question if, uh, if there are any other questions from the audience. Yes, sir, and if you wouldn't mind coming to the microphone and introducing yourself. Uh, my name is Henry Hedker. I, I wondered uh, what your feelings are on the business of uh, if you add an administrative regulation, you must drop two of them. Uh, somehow they came up with this figure at the beginning of the administration. I wonder how far is this going? Do you consider it legal? Should government bureaucrats uh, do as they're told and try to cut a regulation or two? Uh, in order to add one, or should they just stop where they are? You talk about inertia, but uh, it looks like they've got a, a big problem on their hands. Uh, I'll just add, I think it's a great concept. <laughs> but uh, the resistance level, you talk about inertia. If, if you are the author, or if you have been enforcing a particular rule or regulation for X number of years, it's human nature to have some buy-in, I would suppose, to that process. And when you're told that rule or regulation has to be re-examined and perhaps uh, uh, cut out of our regulatory uh, inventory, that's, I think that's something that is hard for people to deal with. Uh, but again, if you're a government lawyer and if you have a duty of loyalty uh, to your particular department, to who's running the department, again within bounds of ethical, moral, uh, and legal constraints, uh, you need to proceed to effectuate that change, whether it's a two-for-one or a complete rewrite or a complete jettison of the rule or regulation in question. That, that shouldn't be uh, the litmus test. And back to the previous questioner, if you are not comfortable functioning in that environment, again, whether you're a Democrat, Republican, or Independent, then I think you ought to seek uh, legal employment elsewhere. I mean, in my view, the, the, the notion of reviewing regulations on a regular basis to figure out if they still make sense is a really, really important thing to do. Um, and I think there could be various mechanisms for doing that. I react to the one for two thing as a bit of a political stunt more than an actual thing. Because how you define what is a regulation, you can combine three regulations into one. Have you, have you, done, have you actually met the obligation or, or not. I mean, I think the, the, the point has to be that we should think very carefully before we make new regulations. We should think through the unintended consequences. We should examine existing regulations regularly and eliminate the ones that aren't working. And maybe a virtue of that policy is that it requires some review, you know, uh, and, and thinking through which ones should we, uh, should we jettison. So I could see some virtue in that. But I, I think mechanisms, this is sort of a different subject, but mechanisms to force a review of regulations and to think through whether we can do them better or whether they still work is, a, is an important thing because the thing can get calcified, obviously, and, it, and that's a, 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 a constructive thing for government to be re-examining itself just like we should all do. All right, well, thank you, David, and if you all would please join me in thanking our panel.